Hi everyone, I hope you are all well. Today is the 13th of October, which means it's the last day of the Cheltenham Literature Festival, and I have just gotten home having been there uh, since right first thing this morning, uh, up until lunchtime, seeing a couple of events. So the Literature Festival is all over for me now. And uh, yeah, it's been a really great festival. I've had a great time. And I'm really super proud of myself because I'm trying to save just a bit of money at the moment. And I have not bought a single book for the entire 10 day festival, which is big deal for me. Um, I mean, I have added like 15 books to uh, my Amazon wish list, but you know, it's just on the wish list. I haven't purchased them. I haven't spent any money. So super, super proud of myself for that. Um, thank you so much also for all the great video suggestions that were sent. If you still want to send me ideas, please um, add comments to any of my videos and I will uh, sort them out. And I'm going to be, now that the festival is done. I'm going to be shooting some stuff for you off that list and I'm really super excited. Um, but right now I want to talk about the book I have been reading this week which is Tombland by CJ Sansom. I say I've been reading it this week, I have actually been reading it over a couple of weeks but because um, obviously the build up to the festival I was very busy with work and everything and I just didn't have these blocks of time to read and thankfully with the festival this year because I only had like one, maybe two events a day, I had all of this bulk time to read. And so I have got, got through pretty much 600 pages of this in five, six, five or six days. Um, so yeah, something that tells you something about how, you know, how far I had progressed and how much time I've had free this week. And so that's why even though I've had, you know, the various suggestions which you guys have, have made for me to make, do videos on. I haven't filmed any of them yet because uh, this has been taking up all my time. But now that I'm done with it and I'm done with the festival and I've got a whole day off tomorrow, I'm going to be spending my time doing some filming for you guys. So anyway, let's talk about Tombland by C.J. Sansom. So Tombland is set in summer 1549. This is the seventh book in the Matthew Shardlake series. If you don't know it, uh, C.J. Sansom wrote a book uh, which centres around a guy called Matthew Shardlake. It was his third novel that he had written, uh, that he, he'd had published, I say, because I'm sure he's possibly <laughs> written novels that he just hasn't had published. And it followed uh, a lawyer in Tudor time. It was set uh, within, I think, a month or two of the death of James Seymour, Henry VIII's third wife. And there was a bit of a, a murder mystery and he ends up going to uh, this monastery, it's called Dissolution, uh, and basically trying to figure out what the hell happened. And this book then set him off on this epic kind of saga, as it were, of telling the story of Matthew Shardlake, uh, which I have been following for about, I think it's 12 years now. My sister got me the first three books uh, when I, I th I'm pretty sure it was for my 21st birthday, and I, I, I just, I fell in love with them. I absolutely loved them. And so I've been collecting the books and reading them since then. And because I have this thing where if it's a book series, they all have to be the exact same format for my bookshelf. I have had to wait a year for this to come out in paperback of this size. So I have been like, really really excited to read this and I finally got around to it. So as I said this is set in summer 1549 which is two years after Henry VIII's death. So we've gone from the first book where we're in Henry's third wife all the way through to a couple of years after um, Henry has died and with this one I feel that this is his most baffling case ever. When you read it, read the actual, the situation of the case, you just go, what? Really? And I was just like, this, in the Tudor time, <laughs> I'm just thinking about modern policing techniques versus Tudor time. I'm like, how, how is this going to work. I was really a little bit concerned because the situation with this one 
is that Matthew uh, is now working for the Princess Elizabeth uh, because Henry VIII is, is dead. It has, the crown has gone to his son. And as history showed us, uh, his son Edward died six years after he took the throne, so about a third of the way through his reign. Uh, it would then pass to his older sister Mary, and then the crown passed to Elizabeth. So at the moment, Matthew is 47 in 1549 and uh yeah so he's working he's working with Lady Elizabeth and he finds out that a woman called Edith Boleyn came to Elizabeth's court basically and because she's a distant relative of of Elizabeth through uh, Elizabeth's mother Anne Boleyn who she's Edith Boleyn and she says look I married into the Boleyn family um I uh, have a I had a husband who has just recently died. I desperately need money. Help me. And Elizabeth's court just went, no, 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 turn around, go away, go away, don't care. Um you know, don't recognise you whatsoever. Fast forward uh, a little while later, a couple of weeks later, and Edith is found dead with her brains basically a skull basically smashed in, uh, stripped naked and half hanging out of a lake. So her upper half is in the lake, her lower, her lower half is out of the lake with her legs spewed wide open for everyone to see uh, her, her privates. Uh, and what is so baffling is that when this gets looked into, Edith's husband isn't dead. He's very much alive. He has a wife called Isabella. Uh, Isabel, sorry. And Edith is has actually been missing for the past nine years. And for three of those years has been declared dead. So where the heck has Edith been? How did she turn up to the court and, you know, Elizabeth's court in London be able just to say, I am who I am? Who killed her? It, it, it's just, it's, it's, it's crazy. And I was just like, CJ, that's, that is very interesting case. But I'm willing to go with it, you know, because the thing about CJ is that he's really brilliant at the way in which he constructs these books. Because obviously, like I said, modern policing techniques versus uh, back then, obviously, very very different pulls apart um so the way in which he looks at characters characterization is wonderful and the way he looks at the world uh, is also wonderful but with this case especially because of um edith's husband john uh it, he automatically gets kind of accused of the crime uh and there's this whole trial process and it's about 300 odd pages in which is which is the point at which i got up to before the literature festival started and then i just took off reading and it just went it goes from like 20 to 70 miles an hour this book um so that first like 300 pages kind of follows his his usual criteria and then suddenly CJ just takes you on a complete, di completely different route. We are thrown into Norwich, uh, which is where Edith was, was found and everything. But at that time, there was a massive riot um, that took place, an uprising against the king, uh, which history, there's very few documents about it, but the documents are there. And CJ spent a lot of his time researching that. And he he actually explains in the introduction how uh, he used pretty much every possible uh, bit of information that he could find about it. And he also says something to do... Um, oh, here we go. Uh, so he says that some, uh, some events such as those concerning the gentleman prisoners in part six and one incident which takes place in chapter 75 may appear a little too far-fetched to be true, but they actually happened. Uh, and he has um, information that the last 50 odd pages of this book are entirely um, historic. Uh, yeah, so all of that is historical notes and him giving you information about this uprising that happened. So because um, 
Matthew is there investigating his crime. All of a sudden, this uprising happens, and he is caught in the middle of it. But how? But I was so, as I said, I was completely thrown that we had this usual natural course that CJ takes on his writing that was suddenly taken off on a detour, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Uh, but to then use the mystery to find that these two events kind of are linked. That is genius. That was absolutely wonderful. I actually had a day where I was at home um, and I hadn't, it was about lunchtime and I hadn't yet gotten up and, and had a shower or anything um, because I'd been, I'd been caught, I was reading so much and, uh, and everything. And there was, it was, talking about the camp and the way it was constructed and there was this whole passage about the dirt and the grime uh, and the chopping and making the huts and the squelching of them it actually made me feel dirty i felt quite dirty and i had to have a shower just to, to um just to clear it out of my head, out of my uh, out of my thoughts and everything. Um, obviously, I needed to have a shower anyway. But but you know how the power of words, how you can suddenly have that that you can literally feel the atmosphere of what's going on around you. And it's set in the in, in the summer, obviously, which is when the, these these um, uprising happened. And it is a truly hot summer. Near the end, it got rather wet um but it is a scorching summer and you can feel the 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 sweat pouring the baking the smell uh like i said the squelching mud the huts being constructed the 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 smell of um meat cooking uh and so it it's it's stunning. It's absolutely stunning to read. So I feel like with this, even though CJ, like I said, completely went off route on a contangent that I never anticipated that he would, he's really showed a versatility uh, in his works, which I can only applaud him for. It was stunning. It truly is stunning. I want to read you a bit, but I'm going to read you a bit, which is kind of um, shows a bit more about Matthew's personality and his issue that he has with his disability. Uh, Matthew uh, has a hunchback. He's in his, what, mid-40s? Uh, like I say, oh no, he's 47, sorry, at this point. Um, and he has always been plagued by it. And it's mentioned quite often throughout the course of the books because of how he's teased by children, um, how he can feel uncomfortable in social situations. Uh, but it's really interesting in this one because they're constantly marching and they're doing this, that and the other. And they're out completely exposed in the world uh, to the open airs and, and everything. He actually finds that his back gets better, and it is that thing that at Tudor times they believed, you know, like during childbirth you couldn't have fresh air um, around you because air, air was seen as um, a bad thing that it would spread disease. They didn't. They thought vegetables were basically absolute crap and they would kill you um they didn't really believe that much in exercise either so the fact that matthew is out he is in the fresh air he's constantly walking uh he is uh eating things that he wouldn't usually eat he actually gets fitter and he's going actually this is this is really good for me and i love that but this is him um showing his complexity about his disability before he starts doing the walking stuff and an event has happened uh uh where uh to do with a, an execution and it's he they got caught up in the, there was an accident at the execution which matthew was caught up in and he was um took a blow and was unconscious and this is him coming around afterwards so this is chapter 31 I woke, a sudden lurch out of darkness. I was lying down, and for a terrible moment feared that I was still beneath the scaffold, amid the baying crowd, Berlin and the others strangling above me. I grasped and tried to move, but a terrible pain shot across my back, and I cried out. 
Then I felt a cool cloth on my head and heard a familiar female voice say gently, Do not move, Master Shardlake. The doctor said that when you wake, you must remain still. I blinked and saw I was in my bed at the maid's head. Josephine standing above me with an expression of deep concern on her face. You are safe, she said softly. Berlin, I gasped. My mouth was parched. He lives, she said with a smile. Now wait, I must fetch the doctor. I should be only a few minutes. Please stay quite still. She hurried out. The pain of the spasm was fading, and hearing a sound beside, beside me, I dared to turn my neck slightly. Beside the bed I saw, of all things, a light wooden carrying crib. Lying within was a little fair-haired baby, Josephine's daughter, Mousie. She's just so you know, her name's Mary, but Mousie is her name. She looked up at me and suddenly gave a toothless smile and reached out her arms. I smiled back. Josephine returned for Dr. B Dr. Bells, who was treated Toby after our fight with the twins, his sharp featured face serious. With a courtesy, Josephine took out Mousie and left the room. Bells raised a, ha raised a hand. Do not move your back or you will hurt yourself. Gripped with a sudden terror, I said, will I be able to walk again? Certainly, certainly, he smiled. You were lucky. You could have broken your spine, but God must have you in his view, for you only damage the soft tissues of your upper back. For now, Leah, stiff as a board, but soon, if you do as I say, you should be able to be up and about again. I examined you thoroughly while you were unconscious. Fortunately for you, I have made a specialism of bone and muscle ailments. You have? I like their practicality, shall we say, compared to some of my colleagues' weird potions. How long have I been unconscious? Nearly a day. It is Saturday morning, but you have not fractured your skull, only given it a nasty jolt when you fell. There was much blood, as always, with scalp wounds. The crowd thought that you were dead. The doctor reached for a picture of small beer on the table by my bed and made me drink slowly. Then he sat, put his hands on his knees and looked seriously, said, you have made yourself the talk of Norwich. Josephine said Berlin lives. Yes, when the executioner pulled you away and you fell off the scaffold, your young colleague held Berlin up, saved him from strangling. I am told Master Overton was screaming at the executioner that he had killed you, that there was a pardon, and he would end up being hanged himself. Dr. Bells looked at me seriously again. Have you landed, had you landed slightly differently, you could have smashed your spine and never walk again. He let that sink in. The executioner took Berlin down and he has been returned to Norwich Castle. He cannot speak yet as he has nasty compression marks on his throat, but he is safe. His wife asked me to attend him too. And the others hanging? Those still waiting in the carts? All the other executions went ahead, of course. He raised his eyebrows. The commons say the gentlemen they had come to see hanged were saved by legal artifice, but the poor folk all died. There is truth in what they say. He gave me a sidelong look that changed the subject. You are lucky that you have such good friends, Master Overton. Uh, good, such good friends. Master Overton contacted Goodman Barrack and good wife Brown, and the three of them have been taking turns to sit with you. Now the spasms will ease, but only if you move slowly and carefully. You must stay in bed at least a day. Tomorrow, or the day after, you may get up. I like my patients up and about as soon as possible. Meanwhile, with my approval, Master Overton has written to your doctor in London. Thank you, I said. I thank you. I think that you and Guy might like each other. Have you read Vesalius on, on anatomy? I have a copy. So does Guy. Thank you, again. Dr. Bell smiled. Wait till you see my bill. Doctors charge even more than lawyers. He hesitated. Two things more. I have a concoction of my own that should ease the pain, but do not take too much. Also, it would help if you were to have your back gently massaged twice a day. Goodwife Brown is offered to do that. A woman's hands are best. I drew in a deep breath. I found it distasteful for anyone to see my bent back. And a woman, Josephine, Bells saw my hesitation. She has already agreed, and Goodman Barrack or Master Overton will be present as well to avoid any suspicion of impropriety. It will help? Greatly. Barrack, then, I said. He has seen my back before. Good. But for now, lie still. 
he looked at me with my lined face and pre premature white hair. I have told I am told that you are forty seven. I am. And with your disability, are you not getting a little too old for such escapades? So yeah. So as you can see, uh Matthew does have issue with his disability, but I think also he feels quite misunderstood, quite awkward and alone. And his friendship with Guy, uh, who I absolutely fell in love with from the moment I read him uh, in the very first book, is it's beautiful, his friendship. And when I, when I explained this actually to a colleague about these two men uh, and their friendship, she automatically assumed that they must be gay. I was like, no, why can't two guys just be friends? <laughs> you know, um, but no, they're not. Um, but I absolutely love, love, love that Matthew. Even though he feels very isolated, he has this friend in Guy who is uh, a doctor. He's also he's also black. Uh, he's completely um, stands out, as it were, in their community, and he is the most trusted. Uh, wonderful friend of his, as well as the character Barrack, uh, who's Jack, um, who I was so super excited for the two of them to reunite in this book because they have been separated uh, due to a situation that happened in the previous book. So, like, yay, they're back together. Um, they're back friends again. Um, but the thing, especially that I just, I really want to plug with this uh, review, or at least get across, should I say, uh, is how CJ has. He is so powerful in his characterization, his technique to pull things from past books. He mentions the Mary Rose um, that uh, there, there is a moment at the, near the end of this book where he talks about how he is overwhelmed at seeing Jack and being reunited with him after a situation. And he said, I, I, something like, I held him as tight as he held me after the Mary Rose. And I just, I had to sort of sit back for a minute and um, because the situation that happened with Mary Rose is the book Heartstone. It's the fifth book of the series. And that book, that chapter had me bawling my eyes out. I have never felt such emotion um, in reading a crime novel before. Uh, and he, just by that few words, he pulled me straight back to how I felt in that moment. Um, and I knew exactly what he meant. And I love that that he has that he has that the the way he makes you feel for characters. I I found myself crying in this one as well. I absolutely adore like characters like Simon, Josephine, Mousy, um, Josephine's husband. I, I just their stories are so powerful, and especially with this one. I think he wanted to show the casualties of war and that it can be anyone and how dangerous a time this really was. And he takes out people who I never anticipated he would or he causes harm to people I never thought he would. And of course, there's always bad guys who end up being okay because that's life. There's, there are bad guys that get through. Um, but... It was so strong a piece, so powerful. I adored the ending. I am so, so excited for the next book, but I'm probably going to have to wait another couple of years or so for the next one because I don't know when the next one is due to come out, but this is the thickest one that he's done so far. And to say that he, it's really a good, massive chunk of this is based on an event where there's hardly any historical um, documents. Bravo. Absolute bravo. Well done, mate well done it is a stunning stunning piece and i'm i'm just yeah i'm blown away by it so thank you cj for continuing the wonderful wonderful story of matthew shardlake and all of his friends and i'm so super excited to see what happens to matthew next now um just so that you're aware with the matthew shardlake series um, there are various audiobooks. I have only, 
Right. The issue that I have with the audiobooks is that very early on, it was Anton Lesser who did the audiobooks, which I adored. Um, he did the first four, I think it was, uh, and then they changed it to somebody else. And I've not listened to any of the later ones because I'm like, no, Anton is the voice of Matthew for me. He will always be the voice of Matthew. I can't remember who it was who did um who've carried on but they've also recorded all the earlier books as well so you can hear that same person do all the books or you can just hear anton's uh, anton Lester's version which is only the first four um but also just want to plug uh bbc radio 4 i think it was have also done dramatizations of the matthew shard lake series they've done all the way up to heartstone which means that's the first five that they've done. Um, so hopefully Lamentation, which is six, and then Tombland, which is seven, will be adapted soon, or at least I hope so, because I really love listening to them. Um, I will put a link in the description to, to the Audible um available you know links and such to just for dissolution i'll just do because obviously there's so many but you can you can find all the others uh and everything there um but if you want me to put any more stuff in the description please let me know and i will do so um so yeah so that's my thoughts of tombland by cj sansom this is going in on my on my bookshelf and staying there with all the other cj books in a nice little row um so yes yeah, so that's what i thought of tombland and uh i guess now because i stopped uh my beginning of green mile to be able to read this i'll be starting on the green mile next Yee. so have you read this book i'd love to know what you think you leave a comment in the comments box below give me a thumbs up thumbs down entirely up to you i'll let you decide and yeah i'll be back uh well usually i say i'll be back for my next review but i won't i'm going to be back with some of your video suggestions uh very shortly all right then guys bye